that, don't like that. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening. And first of all, I just want to give a new shout out to some new followers. So welcome to Dozer, Jeanette, Free, Breams, uh, Avery Wynn 17, JH Whitley 77, Debbie, Julia, J Seaman uh, 980, uh, Glory, Jen, Van, Lily, Jane and Dahl. Welcome and I appreciate every one of you um, tuning in and listening every week and taking time out of your busy schedules to tune in to the podcast. I really appreciate every one of you. Well, today's episode is all about organic pest control because now the growing season is starting to get underway. We really want to be vigilant about pests and checking for those things because ultimately the sooner that we can um, spot pests the sooner we can start treating for them and managing them and the more likely we are to actually save the crop the plant the harvest and if we're not checking our plants then pests can really do a lot of damage and can decimate our crops and one of the things that I have seen over the many years that I have been gardening and taking notes about gardening uh, in my garden journal is that pests seem to hone in on those plants that are stressed, struggling or the weakest. So just like, you know, wolves taking down, you know, an elk or a you know, lion taking down a gazelle, they're going for the easiest targets, right? The the weaker plants that um, are already struggling. So one of the key things um, to really look at is the overall health of your plants. And, you know, plants that are strong and vigorously growing are going to have fewer problems than those that are struggling. Now, if you listened to the episode last week uh, with Julie from Giving Ground Seeds, they're an organic um, seed grower. And some of the techniques she was talking about are things that we can readily use in our garden. Now, when I did my permaculture design course, it was called Integrated Pest Management, um, but it's also known as companion planting. And it's one of the methods of attracting predatory insects and birds into the garden to help take control of some of those pests that you might be seeing. So one of the most common things that people do in their garden um, is to grow marigolds. So these are the Mexican marigolds, the Tajits family, um, not the Calendia or pot marigolds as they're known as the in the UK. Although they do bring in beneficial pollinators. It's the Tajits variety that are actually there that are um, helping to deter some pests. And they're really good at helping to deter a number of different pests, things like cabbage worms, aphids, um, Mexican bean larvae. All those kind of um, bugs are easily deterred by planting marigolds in with the vegetables that you're growing. And the nice thing is marigolds look very pretty in the garden as well. And it's not just planting flowers or herbs in with your veggies. Now, part of the reason why this kind of companion planting method works is because it can um, confuse pests because they can't always see the desired or targeted crops because they're kind of confused by the scents and shapes of different plants that are growing nearby. But one of the tricks that my grandparents used to teach me was planting radishes in with cucumbers because the radishes would help deter cucumber beetles. Um, it also helps with things like squashes and melons that are also uh, commonly preyed upon by uh, the cucumber beetles. So sometimes there are plants that when grown together actually provide some level of pest deterrent for another one. So cucumbers with corn um, is supposed to help keep raccoons off um, and the corn helps reduce wilt in the cucumbers, which is kind of interesting how those two plants can be grown together to help um, prevent separate problems. Um, beans, along with your eggplants, can help repel Colorado potato 
beetle and parsley and carrots can help um, repel carrot fly but what works a little bit better rather than parsley with your carrots is growing spring onions or leeks or normal onions with your carrots because the carrots help deter the onion fly and the onions help deter the carrot fly so there's lots of different um, companion plants that can go together and there's a ton of information um, that's available online and also in books uh, one of my favorites is carrots love tomatoes and that has a lot of good information for different types of plants different families of plants um, it covers vegetables herbs and even flowers and wild plants as well so it's, it's a good starting point but some of the better ways to do companion planting is to take um, lots of notes when you're growing your garden so you can see what seems to do well together and what doesn't grow well together so for example I grew peas near garlic one year and the peas didn't do very well at all and neither did the garlic um, but the beds where I grew peas the same variety of peas totally separate Separately from the garlic they grew really really well and the garlic that was growing on its own away from the peas also grew really really well so it was only really by um, looking at my notes and seeing what was growing in that bed at the same time that I was able to kind of figure out some um, combinations that didn't work well but also some combinations that did now the one thing to know with companion planting is it's not something that is going to be an immediate fix uh, for your plants. There is going to be some level of pests that are going to be um, in the garden anyway. And where I live, there's certain times of the season where I get a lot more pests coming in um, because that's the nature of the cycle you know, for that particular insect. So there's these giant cricket grass grasshoppers not grasshoppers that might be something different um, but grasshoppers that come in and they are very fond of my tomato plants and um, other gardeners seem to get them on different plants but in my garden it's always on the tomatoes so I need to be really checking over my tomatoes and trying to find these grasshoppers um, as they're um, just landing on my tomatoes and there are things that we can do to help deter um, these kind of um, bugs from our garden. One of them is attracting birds because birds see these bugs and then, you know, they're going to come and take a free snack when they can. Um, but of course, attracting too many birds birds into your garden can have some unfortunate issues so where my peas are for example they are just being decimated at the moment by sparrows and finches that are coming into the garden um, so I'm not going to get a pea harvest because of it but um, I might get a tomato harvest because now they know to come into the garden and check these things out now one thing to say is when we're looking for bugs and things we, we really need to be doing this on a consistent basis so hand picking off larger pests like squash bugs the crickets uh, slugs it's it's kind of nasty same with snails um you know it's one of the best tactics to be pulling them off by hand and i know they feel nasty they feel gross i'm never quick enough to grab the grasshoppers and i don't like the feel of them even with the the gloves on they just kind of gross me out um so i'm i'm quite happy to pick up all the slugs and snails uh, but i definitely need to rope in help for the the grasshoppers and going out on a regular basis and picking them all up and putting them into uh, a bucket of soapy water um, to kill them and then dumping that into you know the trash can that works fine um, if you have chickens or ducks then you don't want to be drowning them in soapy water but you could give them to them um, as long as you know you've got birds that are not fussy eaters and are quite happy to eat them but one of the good things to do is to really educate yourself on what bugs are in your garden and find out whether they're good bugs or bad bugs because having that information is going to really help you assess your garden and really figure out is this a something that I should be worried about 
or is this something that you know is is good and I should really leave it alone and encourage more of them you can actually purchase predatory bugs and bring them into your garden so you can um sell or you can buy sorry um things like praying mantises uh, ladybugs or ladybirds um, as they're known in england um as well as things like um wasps predatory wasps and stuff which are going to help your garden but again these are not kind of quick fixes these are things that have got to take time to get established and go through their life cycle um to produce larvae to increase their numbers to you know really kind of make a dent on those populations so sometimes these bugs aren't necessarily um you know native to your area so you need to be kind of careful and check out um your local extension office to see you know what kind of predatory bugs and nematodes and stuff are all um in your area and see what advice that they have as well. Now, some of the common bad bugs that you might run across are things like aphids, whitefly, thrips, um, fungus gnats, caterpillars or hornworms, leaf miners. Um, And the good thing is with a lot of these is there's a method to treat them. And it doesn't always mean that you're having to reach out at the counter for the heavy duty pesticides um not at all um i've not used pesticides in my garden for years um at least not the chemical ones the ones that i do use are omri listed uh, which means that they're suitable for organic farming and they're really a last resort they're the very last thing that i will use if all the other um, methods have failed because i don't like using pesticides in my garden because there is a chance that they can hurt the good bugs that are inhabiting my garden um so some of the methods that we can use to um to help is things like row covers and uh, hoop tunnels so just putting some insect netting over which is a fine mesh and it's going to stop those pests from getting to your plants you do need to get those in place before those bugs start becoming a problem and it might for some of you be a bit too late in the season depending on where you are particularly if you're in those southern states um like my friends in texas um you know they're already kind of seeing increased in pest levels because it's much further on in the season for them whereas for me at the minute i'm having just kind of aphids and slugs and snails because it's it's wet at this moment of time so getting um that row cover in place early that's really good for things like cabbages um, or brassicas which are often uh, plagued by things like whitefly which you'll see as kind of these white um Uh, bugs on the underside of leaves or sometimes they're on the top side of the leaves kind of right next to the vein Um, but if you've you know in that same situation as uh, my friends down in Texas are um, you know you can deal with it without having to put a row cover on there and one of the first things to do is hit those plants with a strong jet of water so you know if you've got kind of a a garden hose that you can turn on and kind of put it so it's like a spray um, and help spray off some of those aphids because once they're knocked off and they're going to struggle to get back onto the plant and that's going to help and you can do that every couple of days you can also try making up a a soap spray so you can get um, like like an organic soap um, or some people use cast aisle soap and mix it up with water and then use that to spray onto your plants because the soapy detergent actually um, stops the insects from being able to breathe because the detergent coats um, their bodies outside and a lot of these insects actually breathe through their their bodies so that's um, a good method to control those pests and that's something that we do quite often we'll use some castile soap 
you know, I've got one that's like lavender and tea tree or something because I use it for a myriad of things around the homestead. <laughs> Most, for, you know, things from like cleaning floors to using it in uh, the garden as a pest control. Um, but I spray it on and I tend to spray it on very early in the morning. Um, so it's not going to cause problems with that plant there's an opportunity for those leaves and things to dry out a little bit later I don't want to be doing it in the middle of the day because I don't want to be scorching um, my plant the, some of the other ways that you can um, manage pests like aphids is using some garlic and hot pepper sprays and there's a few recipes available for those as well um, I honestly don't use them I've used them once but I mean, number one, it stank to make it. Um, and number two, I just, I honestly don't have time to be making those kind of sprays. So I just tend to stick with the soapy water. Um, but if you are intrigued and you want to try it, um, there are lots and lots of people who do and they really swear by them that those work well for them. So I encourage you to give it a try at least once. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need to be going out and purchasing, you know, spray bottles for those things. You know, if you've got a reusable one kicking about at home, you could try using that. Um, one thing I will say is, though, um, is to make sure that you've kind of filtered out um, um, any of the particles from the hot peppers and the garlic because they're going to get jammed up in your sprayer and, and that's obviously not going to help you because for a lot of these things it's got to be this fine mist that's going over the plants that's going to be helping you to deter those insects. One of the other um, kind of organic methods of pest control is neem oil and that's made from uh, the seeds of the um, Indian neem tree. And it's one of the most common pest control products available and it's super easy to get hold of um, and it's got like a residual um, effect that helps to deter the bugs from coming back. Um, you need to be very careful when using neem oil spray on your plants because it can also kill good bugs like bees that come to pollinate your plants so you know use it on things that are not flowering that the bees are not going to be interested in um, really for good results um, and you know we don't want to be harming our bees and one of the other um pest control methods um, that can harm bees is diatomaceous earth and that is also known as DE and it's a powder basically and you um, can dust your plants with it um, if you've got uh, a lot of biting kind of or chewing insects so things like hornworms and stuff um, and what it kind of acts like it's kind of like um, cut glass to insects as they walk over it and stuff it just kind of shreds them up um, which is kind of pretty horrific when you think about it um, but it's good for deterring things like slugs and snails as well um, but diatomaceous earth is uh, rendered ineffective when it gets wet so it's something that you have to use when it's dry however you don't want to be using it anywhere near where bees are coming in because it can really really hurt your bees um, so because I have a beehive I have not used diatomaceous earth for a long time but I used to use it in the chicken coop to deter bugs from the chicken coop and it worked very well um, for those kind of reasons. I have also tried it early in the spring where I was having a, a lot of problems with uh, roly-poly bugs, um, also known as wood lice or pill bugs, um, where they were just kind of coming and eating some of my like brand new seedlings that were coming up and it worked very well until the water got onto it and then rendered it ineffective and then later on in the season I didn't want to be using it because I didn't want to be impacting the bees um, but really some of the best um, methods that you can be using is actually non-toxic pest control traps so slugs and snails uh, particularly slugs very effective with beer traps which is where you sink in a tub or something like if you've got an old margarine tub um, something like that into the ground so the top of the tub is then level with the ground and then you pour beer into it uh, if you're a home brewer like we are then that's kind of easy to come by um, and overnight um, 
slugs and stuff will literally just kind of fall into it and drink themselves to death. So you do need to clean it out on a regular basis. Um, it works much better if you cover it as well, because then you're kind of providing somewhere that's kind of cooler, um, darker for them, and it kind of attracts them into it. If you're not a fan of using the beer traps, then if you've got um, segments of orange or lemon or uh, grapefruit um, or peels of those, um, just pop those around the garden and then early in the morning, um, you know, come and check them and you'll find that there's slugs and snails uh, underneath those. So you can just kind of toss them into the compost heap or throw them in the trash. Um, but that's a really effective way of attracting those pests to something that's not your um, little seedlings that are coming up. And uh, there's, a, there's a few other um, traps. So you can get traps for stink bugs. You can get ones for um, Japanese beetles that are like little bags. Um, one of the other things that I saw was a yellow plastic cup um, that was on a like a, a wooden stake but inside the plastic cup was all Vaseline and it attracted loads of bugs and they went all up in there because they were attracted by the yellow colour um, and then they got stuck on the Vaseline so you could just you know take the cup off toss it in the garbage and replace it with another one so th there's a few um, traps like that that are only going to be targeting you know the pest of interest particularly if you're using like pheromone based traps so we used to trap wasps um because we had a a, f a hive that was um just decimated by a local um wasp population that was here so we would um set up a pheromone trap but what actually worked better than the pheromones was putting a bit of baloney in the trap because the wasps were attracted to that um so they went in to get the baloney and then couldn't get out again so there's lots of different ways to trap bugs without having to resort to the industrial pesticides that are then going to linger around in your garden and in your food Hand picking bugs, I know I talked about it um, a few minutes ago, but they're one of the best pest management methods for bigger bugs. So your Japanese beetles, tomato hornworms, you know, cabbage whitefly, caterpillars, squash bugs, slugs, grapevine beetles, all of those things. It's much easier to pick them off the plant and drop them into a bucket of soapy water. I know it's gross, uh, but get yourself a decent pair of gardening gloves um, or maybe some tongs if you're really squeamish, um, you know, or enlist the help of, you know, family members to go out and get them. And, you know, slugs and snails and stuff, if you've got sprinklers, put the sprinklers on for a little bit in the evening and then turn them off and then go out when it's dark, grab a flashlight or something and you'll be amazed at how many that you find. Um, and it's so much easier to take care of them, um, you know, using that method because you, what you're doing there is you're taking off the larvae or in some cases the adults. So you're going to be reducing that population. So you're going to be getting fewer throughout the growing season. Um, I talked about those um, garden bug sprays and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put um, in the link in the show notes a couple of um, different sprays that you can try if you're interested in doing that. But really, when it comes to your pest control, you know, vigilance is going to be the best uh, defense that you have. So getting out there and checking what is going on in your garden and, you know, taking notes of what is there. Um, you know, if you've got a couple of ladybugs that are kicking about on some other plants, well, maybe you want to consider, you know, bringing in more of those plants to help um, provide habitat for those um beneficial insects and there's lots of different plants that you can be growing that you can also eat to help provide habitat for them 
and growing a mixture of plants in and around your vegetable garden. So not just, um, you know, herbs and vegetables and fruits, but, you know, consider things like flowers and even native plants that are going to help attract and support these natural predators in your garden. And, you know, some of the better plants um, are those that are very strong smelling. So plants that have a lot of aroma like garlic or onions, marigolds, dill, um, these kind of plants have a strong scent and they help to confuse the pests um, in the garden. And, uh, you know, what what could be better than having um, even more things that you can harvest um, that are pretty to look at? They make your garden look pretty and they help reduce the amount of pests that are going to be there. Now, of course, if you do choose to use you know, natural or organic pesticides um, for your plants, you know, please make sure that you do read the label. You do read what your application rates should be and how often you should be doing it. You know, they are still chemicals um, and you do need to be wary of what those things are doing and how long you need to leave it until you can harvest those plants to eat. And that's something that people don't don't really talk about after you've applied some of these um, products you can't just then go ahead and um, harvest and eat the stuff from there you do need to wait a few days before you can then harvest and and eat so you know please 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 make sure that you check labels for things I'm all about safety um, and the last thing I would want is people to be using these organic pest control methods thinking that there is no risk at all so always make sure to use uh to read your labels and uh, use these um you know organic pest control methods um as described on the label for them and you know honestly when it comes to pest control you know you really decide whether you want to use it um you know test them on a couple of leaves before spraying your whole plant with it um you know sometimes you know the, your homemade spray recipe might not work or you know it could actually damage your plant so you know just try it on a couple of leaves first before going all out and blitzing the whole thing um and if there's no sign of damage, then, you know, we can assume it's safe to spray the whole plant. So, you know, just just take take your time when it comes to um, pest control and just remember that every plant's different. Every garden's different. And, you know, what bugs and things are problems for me might not be problems for you. And keep in mind that really, you know, it's all about finding a balance in, in the garden. There is always going to be some pests. There's always going to be some diseases. And by having diversity in our garden, not just diversity from the plants that we're growing um, and planting together, but also the diversity of the bugs that are coming into our garden, um, the animals that are coming into our garden, you know, that's what's going to help maintain a healthy garden is having diverse plantings to attract different things. There's going to be, you know, things that predate predators that are going for the prey and you know the prey might be your plants um but having that balance in the garden is really key and that's one of what's going to help a garden be successful and one of the other ways to be successful with your garden is to really take care of the soil because that's what's going to take care of your plants so i always say that a healthy soil is a, the cornerstone of a healthy garden and it really really is and you know if your plants are looking like they're struggling um you know try giving them a feed seeing if that's going to help perk them up because remember if it's a plant that's struggling it's going to be the first thing that pests are going to hone in on anyway that's it for this episode i hope you found this useful um come on over to the facebook group and let me know what your favorite method of pest control is or if you've even got your favorite um diy garden spray recipe i'd love to hear from you and love to know um, how you grow until next time i hope your garden grows beautifully